What if? 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 What if the gates of hell don't prevail? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? What if? And what if our eschatological framework is a bunch of gibberish? What if? What if? What if? What if the church does come to unity? What if? What if the victory that you presuppose at any stage of your life begins to manifest in reality in this next year? Last week, and um, he was honored well. And I want to share with you today, um, if you would, take out a piece of paper, if you can find a piece of paper, if you've got one, jot down a, a note or a thought. Um, Brad had this teaching called uh, the Master Plan, how to develop a master plan. And I want to just, in honor of him and in projection for next year, talk about the master plan or the master's plan. Ephesians chapter 1, which is one of the richest theological passages in the New Testament. Um, incidentally, the teaching in, in the letter of the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians is so chalk filled with rich redemptive truth. These are the truths that catapulted the church in Ephesus to bring down Diana worship to the fear of God grip the whole city for incredible miracles, signs and wonders to be done for the amulets and shrines to Diana to be burned and for, for Ephesus, the capital of Asia Minor, to shift spiritually. It was the fourth largest city in the world. And so one time while reading through the book of Acts, when I got to chapter 19 and I saw what dramatic changes were going on in such a short period of time, the Bible says that everyone in Asia Minor heard the gospel in two years. So something changed in the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. I call it the point of convergence, where his theology had developed, his, his eschatology had developed, his understanding of the church had developed, the apostolic team was fully orbed now with all five ministry gifts, uh, his understanding of the unseen dimension and spiritual warfare. So once, once I saw what was happening in Ephesus, in Acts 19, I thought, man, I've got to find out what was going on. What was Paul teaching? What was the substance of the believers there? What theological underpinning and framework did they understand to be able to shift Paul's ministry and the impact of the kingdom of God in Ephesus so dramatically? And so uh, we're going to look at just a couple of those thoughts in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. The book of Romans is the pinnacle of uh, the teaching of salvation in terms of justification by faith. It is an incredible treatise on the whole process of salvation. The book of Ephesians has these rich, deep truths about redemption and God's overall plan, predestination, foreordination, uh, the sovereignty of God and how God works. And so and when you talk about God's master plan, which is a little bit different, um, Brad was talking about how you develop a master plan for your organization. How uh, Clarify your vision, clarify your mission, determine your strategy, set goals, uh, determine the tactics, how are you going to implement. 
And so this, this whole concept of planning, for many of us that are in here, because we have many, many leaders in this room, this concept of uh, long-range planning, five-year plan, 10-year plan, 20-year plan, is not foreign to most of you. Okay, but, but guess what? God's plan goes farther than a 10, a 5, 10, 20-year plan. How many of you realize that? His plan is intergenerational. His plan is multidimensional. It not only takes in you and your children and your, um, uh, your legacy and your ancestry, it also takes in the multifaceted aspect of the kingdom of God and relationships. I, I'm thinking just in terms of introductory comments here, uh, you know, the apostle Paul wanted to go to Ephesus. He keeps talking about going to Ephesus. Paul wanted to go to Ephesus, and and the Bible says the Holy Spirit forbade him. The Holy Spirit closed the door. When you realize that um, when the Apostle Paul had what's called the uh, Macedonian vision, the Macedonian call, and what happened in that vision, he had a dream or vision in the night, and he saw a a person with a Macedonian headdress calling him, saying, come and help us. And so he shared the dream with his apostolic team and they, plural, collectively, the apostolic team determined this is God and we need to change course. We need to change direction. And so they went to Macedonia. They went to Philippi. And it was because of that shift in direction that um, the Anglo-Saxon community took the gospel in their hands. So... They put the gospel in the hands of the Anglo-Saxons and they kept it in their hands for two millennium, for 2,000 years. It's only been in recent years that the gospel baton has been largely shifted to the third world and now uh, after all these years, more missionaries are being sent out of of Asia and Africa than are being sent out of Europe in America in 2000 I'm sorry 1989 is when that transition took place so what's happened now is the gospel has penetrated so deeply and missionaries are being raised up in Africa and Asia and being sent to the other nations of the world and so but for 2,000 years think about this one shift of direction putting the gospel baton into the hands of the Anglo-Saxons and they carried it largely to the world for the next 2,000 years. One shift of focus. And so this is important. Please listen closely. One minor change in trajectory, one minor shift right now for next year, by the end of next year could make a major difference. That's why you need to do end of the year planning and projecting and to determine what your trajectory is and just make minor changes, minor shifts in your planning, your time, your schedule, your focus, your strategy. One small tweak right now could make a major difference by the end of next year. So in Ephesus or the book of Ephesians chapter one, I want to talk to you for my, the balance of time here today about God's master plan. First of all, I think most of us realize that are here today, for the child of God, there, there is no such thing as serendipity or fate. That things, if the boy wants you fortunate that that happened or that was terrible that that happened. For the child of God, there is no such thing. Uh, Psalm 37, 23 says, the steps... Each individual step of a, of a good man or what? Ordered. If you're surrendered, you're yielded to the Lord and you're following him, I don't worry about missing uh, opportunities or doors. You know, sometimes we fear, oh, I don't want to miss the will of God. I don't want to miss the will of God. I don't want to miss the will of God. Hey, if you're a child of God and your heart's in the right position, God's not going to let you miss his will. He's a good father, and good fathers repeat themselves. Good fathers discipline. I had an experience this past week. I don't have to discipline the boys very often, but I want to tell you, it's so difficult for me. I don't like disciplining the boys, and my boys are too big for spanking, so you have to find some creative way, you know, to discipline them. 
But good fathers discipline. And I didn't want to have to discipline, but Tammy and I talked and said, you know, if we don't do something, we've got to correct this, this situation. And so God will do that with you. How many of you know God knows exactly how to discipline you? And, and he will not let you miss the door or the opportunity or the path. He will order your steps aright. I remember uh, a group of us were in a small group Bible study, and we were talking about, you know, it's so important to do the will of God. It's not to him who says, Lord, Lord, but it's unto him who does the will of the Father. It's important to do the will of God. And, and so there was almost like an anxiety in the room. And so, but God gave me a prophetic word, and it wasn't until afterward I, I re realized the profundity of that word. And that was, I am a good father, and I will repeat myself. And then he said, uh, he reminded me after the prophetic word in that small group setting that the Bible says, in the mouth of two or Three witnesses, let every word be established. And guess what? That's repeated three times. Moses said it, Paul said it, and Jesus said it. I, in the mouth of two, so God will perform in terms of his relationship with you with the same protocols that he expects us to operate in. And that is, if he's trying to get a message across to you and you don't get it the first time, he'll speak again. I don't know how God deals with you, but usually when God's trying to get a message across, he'll speak to me through his word. He'll speak to me by his spirit. He'll speak to me through the testimony of other people. He will speak to me through specific authorities or influences in my life. And I have found when God's trying to get a message across to you, he will use a plethora or a plethora of, of angles to get the message to you. So you don't have to worry about, am I going to miss the will of God and be, you know, anxious. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, We know these. I'm just putting them as prefaces to the main point I want to get to. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So while we're thinking about planning and setting goals and objectives, we have to do it in the context of God has a master plan that he's working. Now think about this. How many of you years ago knew or understood that you would be in Tulsa, Oklahoma at this time in your life? Let me see your hand. Yeah. And Dave would probably raise his hand. Two or three people. How many of you realize the journey didn't go exactly like you thought it was going to? Twists and turns. and But here, we see providentially God guiding. How many of you thought Joseph realized he was going to wind up in a dungeon, in a, in a pit, then a prison, and then in Potiphar's house, and then to the palace? He could not have determine that course but listen very clearly this ministers deeply to me and if it ministers to me i'm assuming it'll do the same for you we see the hand of god providentially guiding old testament biblical characters and we see him so meticulously charting their course as a matter of fact he so charted the course of joseph that he was painting a portrait of jesus while he was doing it he had him favored of the father, rejected by his brothers, sold for 30 pieces of silver, going down into a pit where there was no water, then being put in a prison with a, a baker and a butler. And I, I, some of you heard me mention this, but it just blesses my heart to know God is so in his sovereignty and his meticulous nature that he can paint, he can take the life of an individual and pick them up, pardon the metaphor, dip their head in paint and paint a portrait with their life without them even knowing what he's doing. He's painting a portrait of Jesus. So meticulous, listen, that even the butler and the baker are going to be painting the cross. Because he's in a prison, there are two dreams. The, the butler who delivers the wine and the baker 
who, who bakes for the king, for Pharaoh. And what's interesting is the two dreams with the baker, his body's going to be hung up and his body's going to be torn and the fowls are going to eat the, the bread from his head, the basket on his head. But the butler who delivers the wine, he's going to go to the right hand of Pharaoh and in the picture is the torn and broken body of Jesus, but his blood being taken before the king. I'll never forget when I saw that. I said, Lord, even in the life of Joseph, from his, his being favored of the father, rejected by his brother, sold like a slave, all of the step. And then in Egypt, he's given a Gentile bride. But he, listen. This is what's such a blessing to me. God doesn't just orchestrate the lives of his Old Testament characters. He doesn't play favorites. He will orchestrate your steps. In, uh, sometimes we think, well, those were stars in God's crown. Those were critical characters in God's unfolding drama of redemption. And I'm just support cast. I'm not the star of the show. Or we even sometimes feel like we're just extras. How many of you know like in a drama, play, or movie who the extras are? The extras extras are the people who kind of meander around in the background and try to make the scene look normal. And all they do is walk from, as a matter of fact, in some movies, evidently the budget was kind of short. I've seen the same people walking back and forth multiple times. (laughs) Trying to create, have you seen what I'm talking about? Hey, that guy just walked that way five minutes ago. There weren't enough extras. And sometimes we feel like I'm just an extra. I don't have a starring role. I don't even have a supporting role. I'm just an extra. There are no extras in God's unfolding drama of redemption. I'll prove it to you from scripture. Paul, an apostle, by the will of God to the saints that are in Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us, past tense, with all spiritual blessings. He has chosen us from the foundation of the world. He has predestinated us unto the adoption of sons. He has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, He's made known to us the mystery of his will. I'm skipping through chapter one. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, he's predestinated us to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. What an amazing, what an amazing list of the things that God has done. First of all, he chose you. He predestinated you for the adoption of sons. He has abounded toward you in wisdom and prudence, having made known unto you the mystery of his will. I want to I hone in on this because this is critically important. God will reveal to you the mystery of his purpose. Now, in, in, in Scripture, there are all kinds of mysteries. There's the incarnation is a mystery. The church is a mystery. The Bible talks about the mystery of iniquity. The, the, the realm of darkness in its operation is a mystery. What, what, the word mystery in Scripture is not something that's difficult to know. It's something that is a sacred secret that is confined and is not revealed until God chooses the right time. It's a sacred secret that you, it's not that you just don't know it, you can't know it unless God reveals it to you. But he says, notice what he said here. He's exercised wisdom and prudence toward you, unveiling the mystery of his will. Now there's two facets of the mystery of his will, and that's the mystery of his sovereign will, what he intends, what he's planning, and then there's the mystery or the unveiled secret about what God has for you. The two most important days in your life are the number, well, there's three. The day you were born, the day you were born again, and what's the third one? The day you discover why you were born and born again. 
Why did God make me? What's my task? Guess what? If, if I don't know what his will is, how can I do it? If I don't know what my gifts are, how can I exercise them? If I don't know what my passion, you see, because God, God has a territory for every one of us. He's got a gift that he gave you. He's got a, a parcel of territory he wants you to take. He's got an adversary he wants you to defeat. He's got an inheritance he wants to give you, and it's not just an eternity. God wants to give you an inheritance, or at least a portion of your inheritance, on this side of the veil. So he's got a territory for you to, to take, an adversary to defeat, and evict a people to walk with. Think about this. He's got a company he wants like Paul. Paul was not ridiculously successful until he had a fully orbed apostolic team. He planted churches. He saw miracles. But when the team got together, that's when things began to shift. You can accomplish, listen to me closely, you can accomplish something by yourself, but it will be very little. For you to have maximum impact in the kingdom of God, you must do it collectively and corporately with the people that God has called you to walk with. There are some people, guess what? There are some people God has called you to walk with and there are some people God has called you to walk away from. There is a team Jesus didn't minister alone. He didn't walk alone. We're made to be covenant-keeping people, walking in community. And there's, for maximum impact, you can't do it alone. Now, I'm not going to take time to, uh, to um, preach a sermon on this or even explain it, except to highlight the major points. There's an interesting passage of Scripture about maximum capacity performance in the Old Testament in the book of Proverbs, and I gave a devotion, one of my devotional thoughts, I just hit these highlights. So Solomon said, there are four things that are exceedingly wise. He said, they are the ant, they prepare in, in winter, they plan ahead. Then there's the coney, it's the, the mountain rabbit, it overcomes its weakness by having a strategy of strategically positioning itself among the rocks. So it's got some place to go and hide. In other words, it overcame its weakness by having a strategy. And then there is the locust. They don't have a king, but they go in bands. They work together. They're not alone. And the last one is the spider. And it says, you'll find that spider even in a king's palace. There's an incredible progressive strategy of wisdom in terms of maximum performance in those four creatures. Start early and have a plan. Develop a strategy to overcome your weakness. Work together in unity with others and persist. Like this, he says, though this little spider's weak, you'll even find this spider and its web in a king's palace because it doesn't give up, it's persistent. Well, he's saying, here's the four things that will make you fulfill a purpose or enable you to fulfill a purpose. Start early, have a plan, have a strategy, work in unity and persist. Don't give up. Well, God, how many of you realize God wants you to succeed? Amen. I mean, let's just be in the natural sense. Which parent wants their son or daughter to fail? We only want them to fail if they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. And then we're thinking, I hope that blows up in your face because you shouldn't be doing that. And guess what? It will. God wants us to succeed. He not only wants us, I mean, let me just back up here for just a second. The whole book of Proverbs, the wisdom writing, is, for the, is a king talking to his sons and daughters on how to maximize their pleasure and performance and to minimize their pain. That's what wisdom does. A king to his sons and daughters, this is how you maximize your performance, get the maximum uh, outcome from what you do and this is how you avoid pain how many realize God wants you to avoid pain 
So what has God done? He's chosen you ahead of time. He predestined you to be in the family. He abounded toward you with wisdom and prudence. He made known to you the mystery of his will. He's predestinated you according to the purpose and he's working all things together for his own will. Now, I want to start with this and take just a few minutes. I'm going to turn it over to Dave. I, I, want to, I want to talk to you for just a minute about probably the most critical element in a master plan or maximum performance. And that is number one, having a vision. Number one, having a vision. In destiny, the word predestination is to determine your destiny ahead of time. So God has a destination, a place, a goal for us that when we reach that place, we will be able to say, I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there's a crown of righteousness, not only me for me, but all those who love is appearing. There is a destiny or a destination. The, the word destinare, Latin, means something secure, something stable, something um, that is fast in, in the sense of it's not moving, okay? So think about this. God has a destination. It's predetermined. God has you on a path for that destination and he has two purposes, one for you to reach the destination and fulfill your mission, but while you're on the journey to fulfilling your life's mission, guess what? He's got a mission. So while you're fulfilling his purpose, he's working another purpose, and that purpose he's working is to make you and I like Christ. We, we quote the, the passage um, <clears throat> All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. We often stop there. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And them he called, whom he called, them he also did justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And that word glorified means that he has brought you to full restoration so that now you're bearing the image and likeness of Christ. That's what being brought to glory is. That, that you, uh, this, I love this, I didn't plan on this, but here it is. Being brought to glory is being brought to the place of maximum performance for the purpose for which God designed you. Yes. Ahead of time, he saw you functioning, every gift, the anointing is flowing, you're connected in relationships, and you're functioning at maximum capacity. And when you're at that point, guess what? You'll be trampling on serpents and scorpions. Yes, You'll be putting the powers of darkness under your feet. And so in the journey to your destination, which is fulfilling the mission, God's got a mission. And, and the journey, the reason he's directing your steps is, guess what? Because he has several cauldrons along the way to purify you and me. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Don't have time to get into that because I, I got just a few minutes to finish this. Vision is a glimpse or a picture of the end result. The path to the vision, the fulfillment of the vision, is also a process, a purifying process. God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. He has something prepared for you, but he's preparing you on the journey. The greatest gift God gave us is not sight, the greatest gift he gave us all is the capacity for vision or imagining or envisioning. Our dear brother Jim Stovall is the greatest example of that. He wrote his first book, I think it was titled something like, You Don't Have to Be Blind to See. The greatest gift, the enemy of vision for you and I is not sin. It's the obstacle of distraction. That's why it's so good at the end of the year to project for next year where you want to be, 
what you want to be doing, what goals you want to receive, because that planning keeps you from distractions. Sight is a function of the eyes, the realm of the physical, material, natural, but vision is a function of the mind and the spirit. Vision oftentimes contradicts the eyes. And I, I don't have time to go through all these. I've got a whole lot of notes here about vision, and maybe we'll continue this at a later time. But this is what I want to project to you in my last few minutes here. What do you see for Oklahoma and America? What is your vision for Oklahoma and America? You know what I see in Oklahoma? I see it to a degree now, but it's going to be even greater. I see the righteous ruling in the government sector in Oklahoma. I see Elena Ashley and Tim Harris elected to the Tulsa School Board. Where is Alina? There she is. We're going to be pushing for you, working for you, fighting for you. She needs, it's the will of God she be on that school board. Amen. I see elders ruling righteously on our city council. I see a united church in Tulsa, and I see a united church in the county seats of Oklahoma. Amen. You say, how do you, how, how, how do you see that, brother, with all the walls and the division and the immaturity and the, and the territorialism? And, because I don't see just with my eyes. I see through the prism of God's word, and he said, this is something I'm going to do. I gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting, bringing believers to maturity for the edifying of the, the keep building the body of Christ until we come to the unity of the faith. I'm not just projecting some idea that I concocted in prayer. I'm telling you what God said he's going to do. I see the Tulsa Public School Board being transformed. Let's widen the scope and change the lens for just a moment. I've already mentioned this. I got ahead of myself. I see abortion being stopped in Oklahoma. I see the LGBT agenda being screeched to a halt in its very steps. We've already seen the SAFE Act passed in Arkansas with the help of city elders. We're going to see the SAFE Act passed in Oklahoma that will protect children from being administered hormone blockers by doctors. We're going to see that. What you see with your eyes says, ah, maybe not. But if you see through the eyes of faith and you see through the eyes of the will of God, you already can envision what I'm talking about. What else do I see? I see not just ORU being a city of faith I see the Tulsa Metroplex being the city of faith. I see Tulsa becoming a fortress of faith, a stronghold of righteousness, a garrison of godliness, a citadel for hope and healing. I see a wall of worship being erected, a wall of fire and worship. I see a national, and I've told you this several times, but I see it. I see a national day of atonement. Not just a national day of prayer. A national day of atonement where the President of the United States will ask churches to all preach the cross and the broken body of Jesus and appropriate the power of the blood of Christ all on the same day. Just like Israel had a national day of atonement. Think about every church who believes in the power of the cross taking communion together. Yeah. Praying for the blood of the lamb Amen. to be applied to every doorpost and every city gate. Declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord over Tulsa. What do you see? I'll tell you what I see. I see happening in Tulsa what happened in Ephesus that Diana worship was teetering and tottering and that the sh silver shrines of Demetrius and the silversmiths diminished to such a point 
that they said if we don't stop these guys, our very businesses are going to close down. I see the fear of God gripping Tulsa. I see the fear of the Lord gripping major cities across our nation. Ephesus, you can't imagine. I know, I know we have problems. I know we've got centers of sin and strongholds of darkness. They weren't anything like Ephesus. Ephesus was the center for cult worship in the whole world. They had a temple to Diana, to Artemis. They printed and distributed demonic literature all over the world. They were the cult center. And what happened? Paul came in and laid his hands on 12 men who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not an accident. It was a dozen guys. Paul was transitioning from, from church I hadn't even thought about it in these terms. From just church planting and missions and evangelism now to ecclesia, the government of God being established. You've got to have the government of God to replace, depose, and replace the governments of darkness. There's no reason to try to depose them if we don't have a government structure to replace it. Hey, turn CNN off. If, if, if you get your information from, from major network media, I tell you, you've got spiritual glaucoma. Your eyes are clouded. You can't see. Do you see what I see? A star. A star. Do you hear what I hear? I hear the footsteps of an army coming. I, I see... An army rising up. I see city elders councils established in every county seat of Oklahoma by the end of 2022. Will you give me, give me five more minutes? I'm not going to have you to raise your hand. We're, we're going to go just to, hey, 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 baby, it's cold outside. <laughs> Why do you want to be in such a hurry? What if, I'm, I'm going to give you some what ifs. Maybe spark some vision. What if, thank you Jim for praying it, what if the gates of hell don't prevail? What if what Jesus said was true? And what if our eschatological framework is a bunch of gibberish? What if the church does come to unity? Please track with me here. What if the church comes to unity? It's going to. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm building this thing. That's right. That's right. What if God really does bruise Satan's head under your feet yes, sir. shortly? Yes. What if the victory that you presupposed at any stage of your life begins to manifest in reality in this next year? What if the things that you've been battling and trying to overcome for years and haven't been able to get them under feet, what if God helps you put them under feet this year? What if the fear that has crippled you or the discouragement or falling into pits of depression, what if you finally put your feet 
on the neck of the adversary. And you begin to walk in the freedom and the liberty and the victory that God had predestined for you all along. What if our present ascended seated position in Christ far above all principalities and powers manifests in time and space? What's the reason for that? Why are we presently seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now far above all principalities and powers? Why? Because God intends to demonstrate it and manifest it in the earth. Amen. Right now. Otherwise, it's just rhetorical gibberish, meaningless chatter. What if a unified church in Tulsa and the county seats of Oklahoma is just around the corner? What if God is raising up apostolic leaders with the skill, gift set, maturity, wisdom, and discernment necessary for identifying the barriers that are hindering the unity of the body of Christ and victoriously overcoming them and walking with gentleness with other leaders, deferring, not manipulating or scheming or trying to build something for personal adulation and self-promotion? but realizes we're on a mission for the glory of the Christ and we're preserving the next generation and we're going to bring glory to God. A glorious church is a church that releases and reveals the glory of God. That is a glorious church. Not a church that is so, so distant from the world that it has become pietistic that's not a glorious church. That's a fearful church. A glorious church is a unified, mature church that takes the adversary on straight on without fear. Got a couple more and I'm going to close. What if every one of the what ifs that I just listed for you were not what ifs at all? What if they are predetermined outcomes? What if they are the destination and the destiny? What if they are the predetermined goal that God said, this is what's going to be. This is where you're going. This is what's going to happen. What if not one of these what ifs was in doubt, but they are our destiny, our future, our reality? What if the harvest of the earth is the end of the age? There's no what if. Jesus said that. He said the harvest is the end of the age. When you come to the end, that's when the harvest, the massive global harvest, it's not the escape route. It's not the defeatist, fatalist, deterministic outcome. My last what if. What if Jesus died, rose again, and in so doing defeated Satan so utterly in public humiliation, making a spectacle of him for the purpose of putting authority in your hands to evict the adversary, depose him, and replace him with God's purposes. Because folks, that is precisely what happened. All authority. So any authority that we're not exercising to advance the kingdom of God is simply because we have believed a lie. That we are deceived that a veil has fallen over and we need the prayer of Paul to the Ephesians. I pray 
for the spirit of wisdom in the revelation of the knowledge of Christ that he might reveal to you the hope of his calling and the exceeding greatness of his riches which is toward you that God will remove the veil and you'll see what God's eternal purpose was was for the church to trample upon principalities and powers to liberate the captive to set at liberty them that are bruised to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the year of the Lord's deliverance. That Jubilee is here. It's not coming. It's here.